Dear Heavenly Father, we continue to meditate on the gift of prayer that you've given us by looking at the Lord's Prayer. And we ask that you continue to bless our prayer lives. Help continue to encourage us in our times of need and joy to go to you in praise and in need and request your aid as you have asked us and you have commanded us to do. Uh, and help us to know that as is evidenced by the prayer that Jesus gave us, that we can do that with confidence as children come before their father. Bless our class today. Uh, may it be edifying and uplifting to those in attendance, and may it be faithful and true to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so uh, I got, I gave a, I had a handout sent out for the third and fourth petitions, but we're finishing up the second petition today, uh, which is a handout from last week. What do you next one? And if you didn't bring your old one from last week, that's okay. Or if you weren't here last week, I'll make sure to give you page references and we'll go as we're going through. Um, so if you have a small catechism with you, um, it's going to be, we're going to be on page 246 in that small catechism uh, and as far as the second petition goes. Take a moment to turn there because the first thing we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to read it. We're going to read it together. And if, if your neighbor doesn't have a copy of it, uh, share it with them. Okay, so the second petition, and we'll read it together. Thy kingdom come. What does this mean? The kingdom of God certainly comes by itself without our prayer, but we pray in this petition that it may come to us also. How does God's kingdom come? God's kingdom comes when our Heavenly Father gives us His Holy Spirit, so that by his grace we believe his holy word and leave God in lives here in time and there in eternity. Okay, so let's start before we begin looking at the specifics of the scriptures and what the catechism says about this. What do you think it means when we pray, Thy kingdom will come? Well, Pastor, I'll tell them what I told you earlier. <laughs> And I say, thy kingdom come. I have always thought it meant come. I know in Revelation it says it's going to be bad. But I, I wanted to come. I want end time so that we can go to heaven. I'm okay with that. Like, thy kingdom come. That's what I thought it meant. I read this and I went, huh, guess who's still in the Bible study? <laughs> I've been for a year. All right, so one, one meeting, one potential meeting is that it's it's our prayer for Christ's second return, right? That, that the day of the Lord would come, right? And that's not, you're, you're giving self, yourself too little credit there, Cheryl. That's not totally unrelated. Um, that, is a, that is a part of our desires, as it ought to be, right? Because for us, that's going to be a day of joy, to return to Christ, right? Um, what else might this mean, the kingdom of God? Yeah, right. So the, the, the point made there is that it could also be that we're calling the, the kingdom of God, the peace of heaven, into our world currently right now. Yeah, so what else? I love the Old and New Testament uh, correlations, and, and I, I look at the temple that was built, and the Holy of Holies, it's the Shekinah glory, it was, you know, the Lord was there, and now our hearts are the temple of the glory, and so... All right. So the, the, the in the Old Testament, the, the kingdom of God was present with the presence of God among his people in the temple. And now that Christ has done his saving work, has risen from the dead, we are the temple of God, where he resides now. Um, good. So that, that highlights two of the big elements of thy kingdom come. Uh, and just one note before we dig into some of the scriptures I've got listed on your handout. That is also highlighted by the fact that when Christ arrives, the gospel, one of the phrases that describes his arrival, is that the kingdom of God is at hand. Okay, so as we're looking through these things, remember that the person of Christ is described as the kingdom of God. Okay, and his arrival means that the kingdom of God is here. Okay, as we go through this. Okay. Pastor. Yeah. So, does God's kingdom come in Revelation? God gives us his 
Holy Spirit. Does that mean that baptism? Uh huh. Yeah. Right. So uh, it was pointed out that in the, the second question, it says God comes when we receive the Holy Spirit. So the question was, is that does that happen to baptism? Yes, it does, and it happens in other places as well, which is part of the great joy and kind of the central purpose of the work of the church. Right? It is this this meshing of the kingdom of heaven with where we are now? Okay. Um, okay. So uh, on page two forty six in the Catechism. It says the central thought here, every kingdom or nation on earth is continually plagued with problems. If God has ushered in his kingdom through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ, why do we still see so many problems in the world today? Sin, but I thought sin was taken care of on the cross. It was. So then what's the deal? We're just no good. <laughs> You're just no good. But that's also not true because now in Christ you are. In fact, now in Christ you're perfect. So you're even better than good. So what's going on? Well, not until we we die, right? We shed our. No, you're perfect now. We have our spiritual nature and our human nature fighting within us always. So I would, I know what you're talking about. I'm going to give you different terms because your human nature is is what has been redeemed in Christ. Right, so the, the scriptural language of what you're describing is the, the old sinful flesh, yeah. right? Yeah. So we are told in the scriptures that despite Jesus's redemption and his work on the cross and the empty tomb was complete, it's not incomplete, but yet I think the scriptures describe as a means of the mercy of God, the time has not yet fully come, right? So the way that the, the day of the Lord is described at times is the ax being laid at the root of the trees. And so it's the mercy of God that he has instituted his church in the meantime to bring as many people to faith through the means of grace, through the sharing of God's word, right, through the bringing of the Holy Spirit, through these means that he's been given us, that he's given to us before that time occurs. Right? Um, and so and in the meantime, the scriptures tell us that until then, our sinful flesh still clings to us. So one of the ways that we say that, the phrase that I like to use is, and I think I used it in the sermon today, actually, we, we no longer live under the condemnation of the law. We still live under the law. But the law is no longer the thing that condemns us. Because in Christ, we've fulfilled the law perfectly. Right? Um, so it's not that the law no longer applies, but that it's no longer the means by which Satan and our old sinful flesh can accuse us of being guilty before God. That has been taken away. Um, so, in the meantime, what what work are we to be about? But the very work that we're praying for here, that the kingdom of God comes, right? And he comes through his word and his Holy Spirit to bring that peace of heaven here on earth until, of course, the final the final day of judgment in Christ's second return. Right? Um, so, uh, and we, you guys did a good job of highlighting kind of both of those meanings there. All right, open up your Bibles to John chapter 18. And we're going to look at verses 33 through 40. John chapter 18, 33 through 40. All right, so uh, you may know this is the, the discourse between Jesus and Pilate on who are you a king of? You say you're a king. And I'll just read it for the sake of those online. <clears throat> so Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside of the Jews and told them, I found no guilt in him. 
But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Okay, so the kingdom of God is not of this world. Right? And what does he say is a requirement or a pre-requirement to understand or even know what the kingdom of God is? Supposed to be in there. Who listens to his voice? Nope. Everyone, on the the Everyone, on the Everyone on the side of truth, right? Everyone who is of the truth. Right? We get back to the imagery from the sermon today, right? We're, that when we're blind, we can't see the truth. And those who are crucifying Jesus are blind. They're spiritually blind. They don't know the truth of God. And so they reject it. Um, and so Pilate is here asking about this kingship, uh, partly because this would conflict with the kingdom of the world. Right? Pilate's a representative of the Roman Empire and Caesar, and it was illegal to have any other king besides Caesar. Now, I know there's King Herod, but he's not really a king. He was given that title as a way of managing the Jews, but he wasn't really treated as a king in the eyes of the emperor. And so he's asking about, are you the king of the Jews? Are you declaring yourself essentially against, against Caesar? And, of course, Jesus gives him an answer that he has trouble understanding. My kingdom is not of this world. So that's the kingdom that we're asking to be coming here on earth when we say, in thy kingdom. All right. Uh, yeah. I think it's really interesting because we hear this debate now, 2,000 years later, uh, when Pilate says, what is true? And, and, and I, I always found it interesting in, the, in this part of the Bible because he goes, what is true? And then it's completely ignored. Um, and, and I'm thinking that that's kind of just showing how blind Pilate is. Um, well, so he is, I mean, when somebody says the question or like voices the question, what is true? Then there's no response given. Sort of the rhetorical force of that is it's sort of Something said in contempt, right? Like, what is true? Right. Uh, yeah, right. Yeah, he was he was basically pushing against the idea that there is this one truth that people can know, which should sound familiar. Right? That's that's something that our culture pushes very strongly. That there is not a truth with a capital T. There's lots of truth. You know, there's your truth and my truth, and this other person's truth. Um, and so, though, and if you believe that, consequently, you do not want the kingdom of God to come. Because the kingdom of God represents the idea that there is a truth, and it's God's truth. And it is what it is, whether you like it or not, whether it's the part you like and the part you don't like, right? That Jesus is coming, and he's doing this thing, and he represents something that is apart from you, and it is what it is. Right? And what we're praying in the prayer is that that thing comes to us. Right? Okay. Since we know that Christ will return to bring an end to the devil's present work of unbelief, sin, and death, how should we live today? Yeah, right? Paul has this sense of urgency throughout all of his writings that Christ is coming back, right? Um, and no one other than the Father knows. So there's two reasons why this should have immediate impact on the way you decide to spend your time and the way the people you choose to be with and the things you choose to say and think about. One is that we don't know the great day of the Lord date. Right? So anybody, first of all, anybody who says they do, you automatically know they're lying. As the scriptures say quite clearly, even the Son of God does not know the day. So certainly Joe Schmo won't. Right? Um, <laughs> the second is that you don't know when your day is, right? Um, so not only do we not know the day of the Lord when Christ is returning, because that could be while we're still alive, but you also don't know your day. Right? It could be tomorrow. It could be a week from now. It could be 10 years from now. You don't know. And so you live as if Christ is coming back anytime, right? And the imagery the scripture uses there is, is the master of the house has left, and, the, and he's given the task, he's entrusted the servants, 
to the keeping of his house and the certain task. And it says, woe to the one who is not doing what he ought to be doing when he asked to return. Right? For some reason, that always made me think of when I was a kid. If I was sick and I stayed home from school, my dad would always say, well, if you're too sick to go to school, that means you're too sick to watch TV and play video games. <laughs> and so, of course, they're not all staying home because they got to go to work and they got to go to school. So I'm there by myself. And so what did I do? I watched TV or played video games, right? And I wanted to make sure that as soon as I heard the car coming in the drive, I was downstairs in my bed with the covers pulled. <laughs> but the truth is, I didn't always know when they were coming home. All right, so there were times where they would come home and I would get caught, and then I would get in trouble. Right? Uh, and that's that's what's going on here. Right? We don't know, so we best be about the things that the master of the house has asked us to do. Um, all right. Now, question two fifty five in the Catechism. There, what is the kingdom of God for which Jesus teaches us to pray? It is the gracious rule and reign of God that was promised in the Old Testament. Right? So the, the Old Testament has all this foreshadowing to the reign and rule of God, which most people thought was what? When Jesus arrives on the scene, when these prophecies about the reign and rule of God, what were people expecting? That's the world. Yeah, that he was going to come, he was going to destroy the Romans and all the people that were oppressing them and establish an earthly kingdom. Right? So that was the part of Jesus that they were hoping for and wanted. Even his own disciples did. But that's not what he came to. Right? That's not the kingdom of God that we were, that we were given. Uh, and then he was ushered in. It was ushered in by Jesus' incarnation, public ministry, death, and resurrection. Right? So it says the kingdom of God is at hand. That's the kingdom of God. the reign and rule of God in Jesus. So is it here or is it not yet here? Well, Somebody's heard that trick question before. <laughs> right? We have a phrase that we like to say called now and not yet. Right? So the reign and rule of God, the king of God, is here now in the person of Jesus. But it's also not yet as the day of the Lord, right? The, the redemption of the final redemption of all creation. Uh, very good. Uh, and the kingdom of God was uh, the it is the gracious rule and reign of God that comes to us here and now by a spirit from the Lord. Right? So you just receive the kingdom of God this morning through hearing God's word. And then on the days where we receive the means of grace, right? The, uh, the uh, Lord's Supper and the baptism is uh, as Ron pointed out. Right? And then it will be brought into its fullness when Christ restores all things and returns in the world. Right? So that's the now and the not yet. All right. Um, what does it mean that it comes without our prayer? That it again goes back to the truth thing, right? God is not going to hold up his business and wait for you to figure it out. It's going to happen. Right? So if you repeatedly reject his message and, and his word of those that he sends to you, he's not going to postpone the day that he's coming back, right? Which is why there is this sense of urgency about about sharing the good news with our family and friends and those we, we encounter that God sends us to is when the axe is laid at the root of the trees, that time is done. We don't know when that's going to be, so we best get to it. That's that's the sense we get from the scriptures. Okay, so that kind of covers the, the basics there on, on thy kingdom come. Any questions or anything before we move on to the third petition? Yeah, they're on. We're waiting for this to come, so we better do this. Make it on us to do it. Well, that's good. That's a good question. So, um, the question was that we're waiting on this, so we better be doing something. Right? Is that making it sort of a law that you got to do certain things in order? So. Um, and it's a good question because we should distinguish what it is that we're doing. What we are called to do and what we ought to do is not save ourselves. It's not what we're, that's not what the doing is, right? Um, the doing is sharing God's word. Right? Uh, 
Um, and that is a that is a law oriented command that he's given us, right? In Matthew 28, he doesn't say, if you feel like it, he says, go and make disciples of all nations. He gives us a command to spread the gospel, right? But the gospel simultaneously alleviates any condemnation we receive for doing that poorly or neglecting to do that, etc. Right. Um, so people get caught up a lot in those questions about, so then can I just do whatever I want and as long as I believe in Jesus, am I still saved? And the gospel says, yeah. Um, but the warning is that if you behave as if the gospel is not real, then it becomes not real. Right? So, uh, but that's not something you or I can know. I can't say, well, Ron, just judging from your behavior, I think you really don't believe in Jesus and you're probably going to go to hell. Yeah. I can't say that. I'm not the judge, right? I don't have the information, right? My job as a church is actually the opposite, right? It's to point to the law and realization that there's something wrong with the world and with you, and you need a Savior. And here's what the Savior did. He saved you, not because of anything you've done, but because of his gracious love and his own will, right? Um, therefore, you are, if you have faith in Christ, you are saved, right? And then my job, the doing part, is to share that news with as many people as I can before the day of the Lord comes. Not in order to save myself, but because now that I have been saved, this new spirit of God lives in me, and my desire is to obey the will of the Father, right? is to follow the Lord. So that, like in the in catechism language, that's the difference between the first use of the law, which is curb, where the curb gets you to do the, the stay on the right path through natural consequences. It's unpleasant when your car hits a curb, right? So the natural consequences of not following God's law are unpleasant. Right? Um, if you don't honor your father and your mother, then your family life is bad and your relationships sour and uh, the good and the blessing that's intended there doesn't happen, right? That's the curve. But when Christ comes into the picture, we get the third use of the law, which is the God. And so no longer through the coercion of punishment, but now because of the new spirit of God, You've been convinced that this is the way you ought to live. And so you endeavor, by God's grace, to follow that because you believe it is the right thing that God wants you to do. So there's there's a there's a shift there when the gospel comes into play. And then you're only really free to do that now that you've been removed, like the fear of the condemnation law has been removed. Right? So Luther is quoted as saying, sin boldly. And it's usually misappropriated. What he's really talking about is that reality that don't let the fear of sin prevent you from trying to do what God has called you to do. Because if in the pursuit of what God is calling you to do, you sin, then in the gospel, you're forgiven by his grace. Now, that's different than saying, I'm going to go out and do whatever the heck I want and sort of spit in the eye of Jesus because the gospel, I'm, I'm good in the gospel. Uh, so that which is why Jesus is focused on the heart and not the outward appearance of it. Does that sort of answer your question? Good question. That's a good clarification. Shall we sin all the more so grace may abound? Right. By no means. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Or is the law bad? Does it make me feel bad? No, it's not. You're bad. The law is bad. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, now we're going to the third petition. And the third petition uh, I wanted to spend some time on because I think this is a a kind of key aspect of prayer. We talked a little bit about it last time with the way we end our prayer. Um, we kind of use this basic phrase, right? An acknowledgement that this isn't like God is my best dispenser and I say the right words and he does what I want. Okay? So let's read the third petition stuff. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What was this mean? The good and gracious will of God is done even without our prayer. But we pray in this petition that it may be done among us also. How is God's will done? God's will is done when he breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, which do not want us to hallow God's name or let his kingdom come. And when he strengthens and keeps us firm in his word and faith unto God, this is his good and gracious will. All right. So, uh, what is the will of God? We'll look up these scriptures here in a second. 
Bring it up to some, uh, at first blush, what is the will of God? Go against the enemy and follow God's work. Okay, so we've got we've got some opponents that need dealing with that are beyond our ability. Right? Um, so his will is to go against those. And then what was the second part? To follow God's word. To follow God's word, right? Okay. Does it stop there? Or rather, how does he get us to do that? Provides faith. Provides faith, right? And then what does he do after he provides the faith? Sanctification. Huh? Sanctification. Uh, this before sanctification. He strengthens it, right? So your your faith is not something given and then left alone. It's continually strengthened and nourished. How is it strengthened and nourished? Prayer. Reading the word. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, right? So how do we get the Holy Spirit? The word is one. And the other two. Yeah, two sacraments, right? The means of grace. And the, the presence of the enemy highlights this necessity. Because when you go out to the world, things may be great on Sunday morning, but come Monday, by 9 a.m., you might have lied to your spouse. You might have been tempted to skip work or school. You might have thought mean things about your neighbor who you know, left a little junk on your lawn or something. Right? And all of a sudden, the enemy is, is assaulting your faith, chipping away at it. Because uh, there's two aspects that are that faith is described in scripture. One is the having and have not faith, right? uh, and then also the sort of health and strength of faith. So one of the common things that flies in the face of the scriptural understanding in our culture is, I don't need to go to church to believe in God, and we say, not true. Right? And we don't say it's not true because essentially Lutheran church is the best place on earth to be here. Otherwise, it's are true. We're saying that because this is where God brings himself in forms we can understand for our benefit in specific ways. And if God has done that, we best show up where he wants us to be. Right? Now, the objection to that would be, well, God's also present in nature and at my house and all this stuff. Right? True. But the only way that that would make up for going to church is if nothing unique is happening on Sunday and some people believe there is a Most of the people who believe that go to churches where all they do is pray and preach. Now, are they getting their faith nourished there? Yeah. But they're also being deprived of some of the greatest gifts God intends for the church for the purpose of strengthening faith. Right? So, the best way to think of the means of grace are like your meals, okay? um, that they sustain and nourish your faith, right? So if you skip dinner every now and then, are you okay? Yeah. What happens if you decide, I don't need church, and you stop eating entirely for weeks and months at a time? You die, okay? Your faith is not something self-generated inside you. It's something that was given to you from without and it's sustained from without. Right? So going into nature and communing with God is not going to cut it. Right? Not because God's not there. He is. But while he's there, he's trying to get you through people and through his own word to go where he has promised to be for your benefit. Right? Um, and it's only our stubbornness that keeps us from doing that. Okay. So, well, God is to face these enemies that we can't deal with and to give us faith and nourish that faith, encourage us to strengthen this enemy. So let's look at some of these scripture passages. All uh, right. Uh, somebody want to look up Ephesians 1, 9, 10? Have you got that for me? Dave, you got that? Okay. And then somebody look up 1 Timothy 2, 4. Super. All right. And then somebody look up 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. P. Okay. So we'll start with the Ephesians 1, whenever you're ready, Dave. Making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. 
All right, so in Ephesians there, what is it saying God's will is? If you were to summarize it with what we just read. Say it, read it again. <laughs> the mystery of his will, according to his purpose. He said to us in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. It's like Christ is the way of his possession. Right. So the, the will of God is to unite all things in him, in Jesus. All that stuff at the beginning is setting up that statement, right? Making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Right? And that's exactly what Jesus does. Jesus came to bring the kingdom of God here on earth, to redeem creation and unite all things in him. So a lot of times, uh, one of the things that I remember learning at the seminary that was kind of just like, I never thought about it when somebody mentioned, I was like, oh, that's right. Is in Revelation, do we go off somewhere else when Christ returns? No. Yet that seems to be the image that we often associate with heaven. It's like, we're going to go somewhere else. Right? What happens in Revelation? New heavens and a new earth, right? And the city of Jerusalem is coming here. right? And so everything is going to be redeemed and united in Christ. So it's not like uh, all like this is one of the problems with like left behind uh, rapture picture is that like we're all going to go off somewhere else and everybody else is left behind on earth. And all that. It's like no, 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 he came not just to redeem the individual human beings, but all of creation. So new heavens and a new earth are are being brought to bear, and all of those things right are united in Christ. Very good. All right, the next one is it First uh, Timothy two four. Who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. All right. Who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So what is the will of God for people? Yeah. Does it say, are there any qualifications for that statement? Any conditions applied? No. Right? It doesn't say when they get it, when they've been humbled, when... They're, they do enough nice things for other people, and he desires their salvation. No, he desires their salvation when everyone comes to the knowledge of truth. Right? All right, next one. Second Timothy 2.4. This is the will of God for sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. All right. So, does God make that rule because he's the fun police? That when we talk about God's will being expressed in the form of prohibiting you from doing something. God is the author of all creation. He created man and woman for a specific purpose. Yeah. Blaspheming that purpose is blaspheming God. Okay. Um, and is that, is that a great place to be? Blaspheming God? Yeah. Probably not. No, no, right? <laughs> so who is that, who is that prohibition for? Yeah, so it's not primarily so that you can judge other people, and it's not primarily to please God even, right? That pleasing God is a byproduct of living as he has created you to live, right? Or, and so his desire, when he's telling you not to do something, is not to deprive you of something, but so that you can enjoy the fullness of as, as he has created you to be. So he prevents you from doing things he knows will harm you, right? So God's will is that you don't do things that harm you. So would you say it's like um, using something contrary to the owner's manual? Yeah, yeah, that's a great way of thinking about it. Using something contrary to the owner's manual, right? So um, we can, it probably doesn't come with an owner's manual because it's pretty simple, but let's say you get a shovel, right? And what's a shovel supposed to do? What's it designed to do? Huh? Move stuff. Move stuff. Move stuff, right? But only certain kinds of things, right? So, like, it's mainly used to dig dirt, 
What happens if you try to use it to dig in the middle of the road? Even if you're really strong, what happens to the shovel? It's all mangled up, doesn't it? Right? Um, so it really, any sort of tool that we've designed, which is a reflection of the propensity of the creator, right, in, in designing us, has a specific function. And when it, as, as Tim pointed out, if you go outside of the description of the owner's manual, they didn't say don't dig in the street um, with your shovel because they wanted to deprive you of the joy of digging in the street. They wanted to save you hours of fruitless work that's going to ruin the tool you just spent $20 buying, right? So in a similar fashion, when God asks you not to do something or commands you not to do something, it's for your own benefit, right? Because um, you're not designed to do the thing that you want to do. Okay? Very good. So if we summarize that, then the will of God is the desire to unite all things in him, in Christ. Okay? It is the desire that all people are saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And it's a desire that you live in accordance with the, your design. Okay. Um, that is a nice little summary there. What's what is the primary issue then with this will of God stuff? Our sinful flesh. Our sinful flesh, right? Because what contends with God's will? Our will. Our will, right. Now, what does our will want? Pleasure and, stuff. pleasure and stuff. That's a great summary. <laughs> <laughs> Our will's pleasure and stuff. Who's pleasure? Our pleasure. I am, right? I just want to do the things that I like to do that make me feel good, right? Um, and the trouble is that my will often runs into conflict with God's will because I'm I'm broken, right? Um, or but um, C.S. Lewis in one of his novels describes it as being bent, right? So if you've ever tried to use a bent tool for something, right, it's not totally broken, but it can't do the thing it's meant to do because it's been damaged. Um, and so our will is not something we can totally trust because it's bent and damaged. And so it wants things that it shouldn't and things that will harm us. In fact, I, I correct me if I'm wrong. C.S. Lewis also said our emotions are something that we should be incredibly suspect of because the devil uses the emotions to to pull in closer to him. Yeah. So, well, and that's a, actually a good clarification when we're talking about will. Um, scripturally speaking, that that concept includes emotion and desire. So the the word in the Hebrew for heart is not like just emotion. It's the seat of thinking. It's your mind, basically. And so when your mind is unwell, your desires, your emotions, and your will are all not well. They're all bent, all not working. Right? And so, um, and we all know this, right? There are things on a daily basis that you think, oh, that's a, a commercial that showed that juicy hamburger. Looks great. I'm really hungry, even though I ate 30 minutes ago. And I probably should eat that. Right? Um, and so there's all kinds of things where our own desires and our own will lead us to places that end up not being great for us. And usually in hindsight, we can see, oh yeah, God was trying to tell me through his word or through this person who was trying to not do that to avoid these things. But this is the cool thing, is that in his great mercy, even when we do that stuff, He's still present in the midst of those things and works them to our good. Okay. All right, how does God accomplish his will? So we're looking at page 254 in your catechism, question 263. How does God do this? Well, first, as, as we pointed out from the scripture passages, right, he restrains the enemies, Satan, right, breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose. We've got... Uh, 1 Peter 1 5, there by God's power you are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Right? So God is guarding you. And we'll get to more of the spiritual warfare stuff later when we when we talk about the deliverance from evil section of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but it's already starting to come up here. Uh, it happens when he strengthens us in his words so that we can endure the sufferings that will come. Now, it's really, really important for us 
to attach God's will or our knowledge of God's will to what? No. No. His word, right? Why is it important to attach his will with his word? That's how we know God. Huh? That's how we know God. That is how we know God. But a little bit deeper than that. It doesn't change. It doesn't change, right? And if you want something, if you want to know something, let's say you make a password for your computer for some sensitive documents. You want to remember the password. The password's not changing. What do you do? It's a password. You write it down somewhere, right? Right? Somewhere only you know, but you write it down because over time, what happens? You forget, right? Or you start thinking, oh, it's probably this instead of this one. The same thing happens with the will of God, right? God has set up the scriptures in such a way where he can reveal his will to his people. So that they can pass that will down. Right? So uh, a great way to think about this, and I got this from a family ministry Bible study. I actually taught it here. A guy named Rob Reno, and he talks about God's plan for salvation is a multi-generational plan. And the reason that struck me is because usually we're talking about evangelism and God's plan of salvation. We're only thinking of people currently living that we're talking to. But that's not his plan for salvation. His plan for salvation has to account for word of mouth, the passing down of knowledge, and many generations of lived people. And so in order to preserve his will, if he's no longer coming to us himself like he did in the Old Testament or sending prophets, because his final word and prophet was Jesus, then how is he going to facilitate the passing on of this news, this knowledge, his will, in a way that, that preserves it in accordance with his wishes. He wrote it down. Right? He had people write it down, spirit-inspired people. And then it would stand to reason, too, that the process by which you received that word was also guided by the spirit. There's one temptation people have is like, well, yeah, but I mean, you can make mistakes in the editing process, and this has been going on for thousands of years, and so... How do you even know? It's not like telephone dictionary, and the words we've got now are totally different from the words we started. Well, for two reasons. One is the process has been guided by the Holy Spirit, and we have faith in that. But two, when you start learning about the very meticulous nature because of the place of the Word of God in our faith, is insanely meticulous the way they copied manuscripts and translated them. So, one example that really struck me was that if you were a rabbi and you were translating a scroll of any of the Old Testament, at the, in the middle of each section, they had a middle word and a middle letter, and they were all counted out. And if you were copying one and that was incorrect, you had to redo the whole thing. In order to, down to the very letter, preserve what you were doing. Um, and so it's important for us to continue to do that, right? And so for Lutherans, and we're kind of accused of being boring sometimes because of this, our thing is always about the word, right? And usually in the history of the church, when we get to the big sensational stuff, the big sensational stuff is stuff we made up when we left the word. Right? And usually when end up happening is that collapses, and where do we go back? Word. Right? Um, and in the history, in our human history too, anytime somebody has tried to destroy the church, what do they do? They try to get rid of the word. Because they know that, well, maybe there's some pesky true believers in this generation. But if I get rid of the Bible, then it's just going to be the things they say, and, and that's not as powerful as the written word. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's sort of the cycle of history, and it stands to reason with the spiritual warfare that goes on in our world, right? There's the devil, the simple world, and our own simple flesh can't abide God and his word. So it's, it's always this back and forth. Uh, yeah. That's why Proverbs uh, 21 30, which I love, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. So whatever they're trying to do to destroy it, it's not, it's, 
It may happen to a few people, but he's still in charge. Right, right. And you can see that why, this is one of the reasons that I'm having you guys read a lot of scripture um, is that connection to the word is what reminds you and assures you of those very truths, right? You're not going to get suckered into believing that if the country, the United States of America, goes down in flames, that the church is dead. Because you read that in the Bible, you know, the gates of hell can't triumph over Christ's church. So the decline of a human civilization is certainly not going to do that. Right? You're not going to get suckered into false teachings about God wanting you to be happy and have the best job and the most money. And if you just do the right stuff, that's what you'll get. But the scriptures don't say that. In fact, you read that there were many times where Jesus said, I didn't, uh, you follow me, it's not going to be great. You're going to be persecuted and you're going you're gonna to have to sacrifice. Yeah, but blessed are you. There's a totally different picture there. So in order to maintain our knowledge of God's will, we look to where he has revealed himself to us. So we, we, we want to keep that the central aspect of what we do, right? Um, I was just sharing in the men's study on Saturday. That's one of my favorite reasons for why I preach from a lecture. Because it prevents me from making the message about what I want to talk about. It sort of nails me to the word. It is. Yeah, it is. Because pretty soon you'll start to be like, yeah, pastor was talking about the same stuff all the time. Or like, he seems really animated about this one particular thing. Right? Um, and, you know, that can be a good thing applied through the scriptures and it often comes out that way when we do pray through God's word but if I make it all about my will and not his will and the word bad things happen right? uh, and so you'll start to notice when you start thinking about this dynamic all the different aspects of our church life where we try to keep the word central and it's for this purpose because our goal is his will not our own and so we try to keep us strongly and closely to that and at times People may think that that's stuffy, but that's what we think is where God is speaking to us. Yeah. Well, don't you have an obligation as a leader and pastor to include uh, the readings and the gospels in your sermons? Well, so I have an obligation for my sermon to be from God's word. So the vehicle by which that has manifested itself over the years in the church is a lectionary where God's word is present. And that's one of the places in the service that I would least mess with because the service is a is a so the term divine service is probably the most apt because you're describing what worship is, which is that God is serving you in worship. Right? It's, and most of the time we think of it the other way. We don't really have anything to offer God in terms of service. Right? Um, but the word of God is where He's coming to us. He's giving us the gift of sharing His will, His word. Which is why our response to church is to this is the word of the Lord is thanks be to God. Thank you for the gift, Lord, of sharing your counsel and your with us. And so the preaching, if it's not rooted in that, is not preaching. It's just some dude talking. Right? So um, so my routine is to start with the word and extrapolate from God's word because my job as a pastor, Lutheran or otherwise, is to preach God's word, not my own. Okay. Well, we talked about that. Ah, here we go. Uh, question 266 on page 256 in your catechism. Should I be anxious about discerning God's precise will in my daily decision? So this is one of the things I want to talk about because people will say, um, and I feel like God is leading me to do this. That's very, very specific. Um, is that what we, we are to be like really worked up about those particular things? Well, he says, do not be anxious about anything. Yeah. Right? So by like current <laughs> supplication, make all your requests known to God. Right. Yeah, do not be anxious about anything. So that seems like a perfect abutment because we're, I mean, of course, we seek his will, right? But trying to divine every step we take is not practical or realistic. And I think that's what's really hard about the human condition is that when we think about it, we have so many choices every day, right? And it starts the moment we wake up, right? 
do we do we start with a with a word of prayer? Do we start you know start it out right, or do we do this and that right? Do we walk the dog? Do we make our breakfast? Have our coffee? What's the order? Am I late for this thing? And then it's just what it is. And so it, it it seems like we can drive ourselves crazy, right? If we're if we're worried. Yeah. 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 And, and that's that's exactly right. So um, when you're in the scriptures. There are certain things where God's will is precise, specific, and clear. Right? So a great example of that is the Ten Commandments. So if you're asking yourself, should I lie today? What does the Bible say? <laughs> no, right? Not really under any circumstances, right? Um, or should I cheat on my spouse or have sex outside of marriage? No, right? Those are all really specific things. And so the scriptures does give us specific stuff on how to live our life. That are relatively easy to process, but there's also a lot of areas that aren't directly addressed. Like, should I buy my 11 year old an iPhone? The Bible doesn't really tell you, yeah, you're nay on that. Now, so there's a, a, a Greek word that speaks to that sort of gray area called adiaphora, right? And the word adiaphora represents the idea that there are things in scripture that are not explicitly prohibited, nor are they explicitly commanded. Right? And so you're left with a seemingly act of your own will to decide what to do. Right? Um, in those areas, we're called to understand our lives in the context of the freedom of the gospel. Right? That reality is behind Luther's statement, sin boulders. Right? So if you believe that you can buy your 11-year-old an iPhone and do it in a way that is helpful to them, provides benefits and protects them from the potential dangers, you can try that. Right? And it's not like, oh, you sin. Right? Um, or, just as equally correct, would be to set the decision. Now, I don't think we can do this. Because you know, those that might be a different question for different people, different children, etc. Right? Um, and so, the, the only potential danger with something that's audio offer is if we ourselves, or as the church, lay claim to add to the law of God by saying that this thing that is neither commanded nor denied in Scripture is the only thing. So a good, good example of that would be, you must have a procession in your church service in order for it to be real divine worship. Okay? And your response to that should be, show me that in the Bible somewhere. Okay? Um, now, can it be a great practice and something that you maybe the church decides to do because, oh, we want to get more of our young people involved in the service, and here's an opportunity to get more people doing young, young people doing things, and we can teach on what the, symbol, the symbolism of that practice means? Sure. But it's certainly not something worth causing division in the congregation. Right? Um, so, the, so that kind of helps with those sorts of things, like the small decisions about when you should walk your dog and, and what you should eat for breakfast and all those sorts of things, right? Um, so scripture, again, is our guide there where God has given us clear commands for daily life choices in certain areas and in other areas he hasn't. And so we do our best to apply this, the principles of scripture to those situations. But we do that knowing that we live under the grace of Christ. And given that we are still have our old sinful flesh clinging to us, we may mess it up sometimes. Right? Just because it's already offered doesn't mean it can't be turned into something sinful. Right, so that's kind of the, the way that we operate in going into that. Romans 14 is a perfect place to see that also. Do what? Romans 14 is a perfect place to see the audio opera. Where Paul's saying, you know, except those who are weak and saved, stop, stop passing judgment, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Right. And he talks about the, is that the passage where he's talking about meat sacrifice to idols? Or is that a different one? I think that's in Romans. But it's but a similar you're right, you're right. Yeah. Uh, he who eats meat, uh, eats to the Lord, uh, for he gives thanks to the Lord. He will abstain, does so for the Lord, and gives thanks to God. Right, right. So that, that would be an example of you and I might know that that idol was just a hunk of stone, and so anything sacrificed to it is still just regular meat, and we'll eat it. But maybe our buddy, who's just become a Christian, used to practice that, and it causes him great spiritual trauma to see his fellow believers eating meat that was part of an old worship system that he now thinks is terrible, then for his sake, we should abstain. But when you're at home by yourself, 
kind of like a home oh, associate. Yeah, Trish. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, like, with that all the offers where it isn't condemned nor condoned, um, it depends on what our motives are for what we, why we do those things. Sure. You know, like buy an iPhone for your child because it protects them for so he's better than the other kid in the class. That's two right. different things. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it, like. And that, that applies to a lot of situations, right? The, the the motivation of your heart, which is why, you know, that's why Jesus brings the, the realm of law into thoughts and not just deeds, right? Is that God's concerned primarily with your heart, right? And so you, you'll need to repent of sins that, that nobody else knows about except for you. Right? Maybe you got that car because you wanted to show off to your neighbors, right? Or maybe you bought it because you needed that particular car because you had to take a bunch of people to school, right? Mm -hmm. right? Um, so, yeah, and you can, and any, and you can also apply that same principle of the intent of the heart to things explicitly commanded, right? So, um, I should serve, you know, serve my neighbor. That's something that I ought to do, right? But I can do that because I want adulation. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, look at me! See, I helped that lady with her groceries across the street. Yeah. Did you notice, right? right. Um, in men's Bible study, we talked about the story of Mary and Martha. And that's what Martha was doing. Martha's work as a hostess or her request of Jesus to have her sister help her, those were sinful. But her intent was to impress Jesus and perform the act of hosting in a way that would be recognized. And so when it wasn't recognized, what was her response? Yeah, she was disgruntled. Excuse me. Right? And she even she enlists Jesus into her 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 play acting work. So um well, and a different angle on that. Um, I've got a good Christian brother friend of mine who's Baptist. When I go to his house, I don't bring a bottle of wine. Okay. Right. When he comes to my house, I hide my bottles. You're not. You're, you don't. You right. don't go and be like, I'm free in the gospel. <laughs> 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 right. Stinks to be you. Yeah. Right. yeah, that's not. That's not how we do it. Right? <laughs> uh, and then the last, the last point I'll make on this section is. Uh, is under question 267 there on that same page, letter B. In making decisions, I can also consider the many gifts that God has provided me in everyday life, my specific callings, my abilities and interests, the needs of those around me, the opportunities that's laid before me, and the counsel and wisdom of others. So part of our means of grace theology is that we believe that for our benefit, God sort of crystallizes his will and his communication with us in specific ways. So the Lord's Supper is a perfect example of that. It's just bread and wine, and we're gathered around a railing, and so another human being gives it to you and says some words. That doesn't seem all that significant, but God made it significant for our benefit. Right? Uh, and so, too, like uh, when I was considering the call to come here to Ascension and serve as a pastor, I didn't just sit in my room and pray and request like God's verbal assent to say, yes, you should go, Adam, to Ascension. Right? Um, and full disclosure, he didn't do that for me. <laughs> but I was still at, I was still very much at peace with that decision and felt that God led me here, but not because he just straight up told me, but because through my interaction with you and my previous congregation and my own gifts and talents, it became clear to me that I had some things that Ascension was in need of and that I felt God could use me here more than I was being used at my previous call. And so using those sort of first article gifts, as we would call them, were like you know, leadership or counsel or conflict mitigation or whatever it is, right? all those different kinds of gifts, when God puts you in a situation where they can be used, then you, you, know, you prayerfully consider what you ought to do and then you use them. That's, that's a counter. Were you not called somewhere before this? Did you want to talk on that? Oh, well, I did. So I, I was called, uh, I had received my first call prior to Ascension um, when I was, or I should say my second call. The first call was to Erewhon in Ohio, where I was at. But I received another call, which I, I returned. Now, in the pastoral call process, both are legitimate calls. So there's really not like a, a total right or wrong answer uh, because both of you have been called by that congregation. To serve as pastor to them, um, but your discernment process is trying to figure out where God is leading you to be most effective. 
Um, so it's not like, oh, if you make the wrong choice, both congregations are just done. <laughs> um, they're both legitimate calls. But uh, one was was to a position that I felt I would not be the best person to call to do those roles. And a lot of that was based on um, evaluation of my own gifts and talents and, you know, as a pastor and as a person. Um, but it also was affected by words that people shared with me from my own congregation about um, they were much less ready for me to leave, not out of selfish concerns, but they all like it was kind of weird. The first the first time I contemplated a call, most of the people who came up to me had very specific reasons why they thought I should stay. And ultimately all of them, again, in this exercise we're doing right now, said, but it's God's will that, that it's done here. Um, but when I got a call from Ascension, there was much more of a, we, of course, would love for you to stay, but we understand that God has made you elsewhere. And there wasn't a lot of really specific things. Um, and so, and, uh, you know, this is sort of hindsight, so getting a little in the weeds here, but the contemplating of that first call was in February of 2020. So, like, the month before COVID. Right? So, it could be that. I wasn't meant to go until they had worked through all the COVID stuff. But so, like, as a sort of evidence by some of what I'm saying here, I didn't know the full counsel and will of God. And so he's gifted me with the ability to think through the gifts he's given me and the places where he's called me and using the voice of the congregation of ascension. God spoke to me to consider coming here. Right? Um, and so that's a reflection of what are the, the sort of interplay between our will and God's will and our new life. Right? It is largely informed. All the big important stuff is informed. Right? Like, I'm a pastor. God called me to be a pastor. So whether I'm a pastor here or a pastor there, I'm called to do a specific thing. And that's pretty divine. But then when I get into the weeds of where I should be at one particular time, there are other ways in which he communicates to us. You know what? Glad you decided to be here. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if I decided. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not thinking, but, but I'm, I'm happy to be here regardless. Um, but then, so this is, and then letter C, and this will we'll end on this. Oh, right. Um, so letter C there, and this kind of sums up a little bit of what we've been talking about, but I like how it's said here. Finally, I can pray for God's blessing on my decision. Knowing full well that I daily sin much and can never completely avoid sin in this life. I live each day in the forgiveness of sins in Jesus, knowing that my God is a God of blessing who promises to work all things for my ultimate good. So, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're unsure of where God is leading you or what decision you should make, stay prepared. But also recall what God's will is for you. His will is that all things are united in him. His will is to face your enemies that are beyond your power to confront and defeat them in the end, and that all come to the knowledge of truth and salvation. And so he wants your good, and he's given you gifts and placed people in your life um, in order to accomplish all of that and give you his work. And so just remind yourself, I'm going to give this over to you, Lord. I'm going to trust and ask for your blessing on the decision I make, knowing that I might mess up, but if I do, I know that I live under grace. And I, I go and repent of that and move on. Right? Um, because the devil would love to get you frozen. He would love to get you so worried about doing something wrong. That you're not right? Because what you're doing when you live that way is you are forgetting that you are forgiven in Christ. And you don't want to forget that. All right. All right, we'll finish up with the uh, fourth petition next week and possibly get into the fifth. Uh, let's close the word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that your kingdom has come in place and that because of his love and mercy and the gift of faith and the work of the Holy Spirit, that kingdom of God is in us now. We look forward to the day when you return and it manifests fully in all of creation in the final restoration. Until that time, grant us a zeal, a joy, and a peace to share that message and word with anyone that we come across, those that are in our lives and our family and friends, and those that you bring into our paths and work and into our lives. And Lord,
Lord, we also thank you for your good and gracious will. That despite our sinfulness and unworthiness, your will is to face our enemies on our behalf. Enemies that we are despairing of because we cannot face them in our own. We're so thankful that your desire is that everyone comes to a knowledge of the truth, the love of God through Jesus. And we're so thankful that you have given us your will and your word to guide our decisions in every day. But help us in the midst of all that to remember that at times our own will is going to get in the way of yours, that we need to repent of that. But also that when those things occur, we live under the grace of Jesus. Do not let us be paralyzed with fear or concern about all these tiny details about whether or not we're doing the right thing. The moments where we do the right thing, let us give glory and honor to you. And those where we come become aware that we have sinned, help us come to humility before your throne of grace and grace of our sins. And be reminded that we live under the grace of Jesus. Bless us this week as we go about all the tasks that you have laid before us. We guide our hands in accordance with your will. In the name of Jesus. Also, should we do the next one? Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so I had to read the first 10 chapters of Job, which I hope you enjoy. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, next week we're going to talk about um, why his friend's advice sucks. Uh, <laughs> and that's a big chunk of the book. Uh, but it's kind of hard to understand because there's a lot of really uh, picturesque algorithm language used there. So we're going to break that down a little bit. So we're going to read um, the next uh, 10 chapters of Job this week. So so 11 through 20. Okay. Job 11 through 20. Thanks for reminding me. Have a great week. Thank Guys you. watching online, thanks for joining us. Have a great week.